You don't have to put the A in there. In there. Just 05. This is Chapter 5, Peacetime Aviation. I'd recommend you leave the A out. Yes. Go ahead. I don't mind a bit. Thank you for reminding me. So does anybody remember, no, how many chapters are there in this book? 70, 72 chapters. I'm just kidding. I don't know how many chapters there are. All right. So when I say peacetime aviation, when I say peacetime aviation, I'm talking about right after, the 10 years after World War I. So just to reiterate, World War I started in 1914. And the bullet stopped firing in 1918, so it was about four years long. And the U.S. was in how much of it? About about 18 months, about a year and a half. Okay. And then the Treaty of Versailles was in 1919. So we're talking about this next 10 years. So effectively, we're talking about 1918 till around 1930 is what, when I say peacetime aviation, is really talking mostly about the 1920s. So a lot of distances had the record broken. The first airplane crossed the North Atlantic. It was a United States Navy airplane. It was an NC-4 was the model. There were six people on it. And it occurred in 1919. And if I'm really good, I put a nice picture on the very next clip. So does anybody remember when the first airship crossed the Atlantic? When? The 1800s? No, sorry. Remember, anybody remember which airship it was? Okay, I'll take that as a no. I think it's, it's on one of the slides coming up. So here's a picture of the NC-4. You can see one person way up in the front. You can see what's probably two pilots in front of the engines. And then there's a spot in the back where it looks like there's at least two heads sticking out. So I guess the sixth person is going to the bathroom. In any case, it's a flying boat, which is really nice if you have to land. You land in the water. Of course, if you don't have a radio, it's hard to tell people where you are. you notice it's a biplane. It's even got two horizontal stabilizers in the back. A lot of wires. Man, this thing had a lot of drag, so it wasn't the fastest machine around. Okay, but that was the first crossing. They stopped a lot of places. Now, how about the first non-stop airplane crossing was in a World War I surplus Vickers Vimy. Vickers is the manufacturer. Vimy is the model, like a Chevy Impala. But this is a Vickers Vimy. Vickers was made in Great Britain, and it was a bomber. It was a bomber. They made this bomber near the end of World War I. And they flew it, a couple, couple of gentlemen flew it across the North Atlantic nonstop, effectively from Ireland to Newfoundland, Canada. And there was two people. They did it, a little, they did it the next month in 1919. And I have a really nice picture. It's a pretty awesome flying machine, actually. I mean, if you like strategic bombers. But I like strategic bombers. So there's a picture. I have a better picture here shortly. It'll hold more than two people. It'll hold two pilots. I think there's room for a bombardier. But it's a pretty big airplane for World War I. Any questions on that slide? Whoops. I, I messed up the date here. This is really 1919, July 1919. There were not airships uh, in 1019. That's actually 1919. But that was the first airship crossing of North Atlantic. Yes. The last three bullet points, you bet. The first nonstop airplane crossing of the North Atlantic was by a Vickers Vimy. There was two people on board, and they did it in June of 1919. You all good? Okay. So we covered this on a previous day. It was the Royal Air Force, the English Royal Air Force. The R-34 was the model. There was 30 people on it, and they also did it in 1919. 
And, of course, the first round trip was when the R-34 turned around from North America and flew back to Great Britain. So, yeah, they had all this stuff left over from World War II. It's like, hey, we ought to do something awesome with it. I think if I had a dirigible that would hold 30 people, I'd tie it on a rope and just have parties. Yeah, come on over, climb the ladder. It'll be fun. You're going to listen to Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. ACDC. Def Leppard. Iron Butterfly. Three Dog Night. Let's see. Disturbed. Uh, Lincoln Park. Let's see, White Snake. Uh, let's see, I don't know a lot of er, later heavy metal bands. Rat, yeah, lay it down. See, I think they have one song that goes, Loving you's a dirty job and I'm the one to do it. I think that's from the lyrics. Don't ask me what that means, I don't really know. Well, unless you see me, at, unless you see me after class. So there's another picture of the R-34, the first airship to go across the Atlantic nonstop. But we've seen a picture of the R-34 before. And here, later the same year, different Vickers Vimy had four people. I think it was a couple of pilots and a couple of mechanics. And this is what I think is cool about it, because they did it with one ship. They went from England, flew all the way to Australia. Just so you know, it was not nonstop. They stopped a bunch of times. But still, we're in 1919, so it's still that calendar year after the war was over. They flew from England all the way to Australia. At that moment, that was the farthest distance anybody had taken an aircraft and gone from one point to another, including stopping for gas. But that, how far is it from England to Australia? Even the short way, it's probably like 10,000 miles or something. And here's a closer picture of a Vickers Vimy. I like this picture bigger. Remember, this, this doesn't show all the wings, but it's a lot better close-up picture. And this is, a, this is a restored Vickers Vimy. This is not a picture from the early 1900s. But you got to dig it because they're wearing leather, with leather hats and goggles. What's that? I think they would have frozen lots of parts. Yes. I think it would be good to have done this in the summer. But that's just my opinion. Unless you had heated underwear. All right. Back to airships. We're going to talk about airships in the United States. Airships in the United States. The first airship that the United States military had was the Roma. And it crashed and burned. And it had, hydro it was, it had used hydrogen as the lifting gas. One nice thing about the United States back when is that you could, they had found helium deposits in the United States. And so we started filling our, our dirigibles with helium. But we were not very nice. We did not sell our helium to other countries, like to Germany. So when they were making all the Zeppelins in Germany in the 1920s and the 1930s, we wouldn't sell them helium, so they had to put, a, put hydrogen in them. So there's the Roma. Looks like a semi-rigid dirigible to me. And that's what's left of what was left of the Roma. I hate that. The Shenandoah, and just so you know, these were the United States Navy. In Great Britain, the Royal Air Force got the uh, the dirigibles, but in the United States, the U.S. Navy got it. The Shenandoah crashed. Fortunately, it was being it had helium in it, so it didn't burn. The problem with these dirigibles is that if you get a pretty good thunderstorm, it could blow these things around like a toothpick in a hurricane. That's not much of a different metaphor, I'm not sure. In any case, the Shenandoah crashed. There's a picture of the Shenandoah before it crashed. There's a picture after the Shenandoah crashed. Yay, it didn't burn because it had helium. The Los Angeles somehow did not crash. 
I think I have a picture of the Los Angeles. There it is. United States Navy, Los Angeles ship, dirigible. What's that? Question? Answer? Comment? Airships made in Germany, the Graf Zeppelin, which I think is the most awesome Zeppelin ever made. But uh, that's unprejudiced. Well, I don't know if I'm prejudiced. I think it's awesome because it was the first airship to go around the world. But it entered transatlantic service as an airline in 1928. You could buy a ticket. Now, you had to be ridiculously rich. It was prob- Today, it would be like buy a $10,000 one-way ticket or something crazy like that. So when I say ridiculously rich, I mean ridiculously rich. But you could buy an airline ticket to fly on the Graf Zeppelin and fly across the North Atlantic. So you could do it in, in a couple, three days instead of doing it in two or three weeks if you were by ship. And that's probably why people did it is because they wanted to be cool. They, they didn't have ten, really cool tennis shoes back then. Nike and Adidas were not in Converse. They didn't make tennis shoes back then. So the only way you could be cool if you were really, really rich was, is to not have you know, fluorescent tennis shoes, you bought a ticket on a Zeppelin and flew across the Atlantic in two or three days. So here's a picture of the Graf Zeppelin, LZ-127. Very nice machine. So if you recall from the last lecture when we finished World War I, in the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was not supposed to have powered airplanes. So they built gliders. So a lot of people flew gliders in Germany. In fact, for several years, the quality and quantity of gliders in Germany went way, way, way up because of those restrictions on powered civil airplanes. The nice thing about gliders is they're cheap. Dig that. Who would fly this? If you know how to fly a glider, you can take flying lessons. Yeah, LX would fly. I would. Although, just so you know, there is a seatbelt. So you don't fall out too easily. No crash bars, no uh, no uh, airbags. Here's another glider. A lot of winches and a lot of pull, uh, towing it or pushing it down a hill. So there's a whole bunch. Dun, 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 dun. This is where you play uh, Flight of the Valkyries. Does anybody watch? Uh, I'll, have to, I'll bring in. I'll bring in a, a nice video clip with the Flight of the Valkyries. Does anybody remember who 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 wrote? Wagner? Was that Wagner? I think it was Wagner that wrote Fly the Wagner. All right. Barnstorming. Barnstorming occurred in lots of countries, and we're mostly going to talk about the barnstorming in the United States. And when I say barnstorming, it's like a one airplane air show is really what it is. And, of course, you can also sell rides in your airplane. So you'd land outside of a city, and somebody would come and look at your airplane, and they'd go into town and tell people, hey, you can get airplane rides out there, and They'd fly up, do a couple of upside-down maneuvers and stuff, and then they'd sell rides for a dollar, stuff like that. The the Jenny is like uh, uh, the Jeep of war surplus airplanes. The JN-4 was made by Curtis, which we remember, maybe we remember Glenn Curtis. But a boatload of these Jennies were made for World War I, but didn't go into action. So what ended up happening is these got sold to the public by the federal government really, really cheap. So there was a lot of these JN4s. So that's what a JN4 looks like. It's got two seats. It works out really well for trainer. It's a reasonably simple airplane to fly. The airplane was made by Curtis, and it actually the engine was made by Curtis. Oh, yeah, there it is. It had a Curtis OX-5 engine in it. And there's, a, wow, a nice water-cooled V8. Woohoo! Nice V8 engine. So if you had, wa- if you had went through across the, the 48 states of the United States in 1919, 1920, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 and said, hey, have you ever seen an airplane? If somebody said yes, 80, 90% of the time, they they would have said that's the airplane they saw. Of course, it wasn't just the Navy with dirigibles. It was the United States Army. And in 1921, a gentleman by the name of Billy Mitchell, he was an Army officer, but he was a pilot. He was in the Army Air Corps. 
and he's a rather famous person in aviation in the United States. In fact, I'd say if you had to name the top ten most influential aviation people in the United States, I would put Billy Mitchell as one of those top ten. And what he did in 1921 was that when after the United States and the Allies, uh, or the Central Power, was it the Central Powers? I can't remember. The good guys won World War I. The, we confiscated, because we thought we were the good guys because we won, we confiscated battleships from the other side and did whatever we wanted to with them, like melt them down into junk or use them for target practice. And that's what Billy Mitchell did. Billy Mitchell took uh, some Army bombers and dropped bombs and sunk a surplus German battleship in 1921 because he believed that if you used airplanes correctly, you could do a lot of things that people hadn't done very well in World War I or had not done yet. And in fact, they just started trying to shoot submarines with airplanes in World War I, but nobody even considered that you could knock out a battleship. Because you got to understand, back in, the, in 1921, a battleship had very thick metal on the sides. So it could, if it got hit on the side by another battleship, it would dent it. It might make a little hole, but it wouldn't sink it. But what was interesting was the, the shells would come in kind of from the side, but not straight down. And on straight down, a lot of the metal of the ship was lighter or was made out of wood. So Billy Mitchell understood this, so he dropped bombs that landed straight on the top of the battleship and would blow up and knock a hole in the top of the battleship and sink it. The problem was nobody really thought that that would happen because they said, oh, your battleship wasn't moving. In real life, it'd be too hard to hit it correctly. And, of course, they were wrong. You can sink battleships with airplanes. But I think this is a significant moment in aviation history is when a battleship, even though it was sitting there, got sunk. In 1923, the United States Army had the first airplane that flew across the, tra the continent of the United States, the 48 contiguous states. Let's face it, back in 1921, how many states were in the United States? Does anybody know what year Hawaii and Alaska joined the Union? Was one in 1958 and one in 1959, or were they both in 1959? I can't recall. But both Hawaii and Alaska didn't become states until the late 1950s. So in 1923, there was the Hawaii and Alaska were territories, like Guam is a territory, and the U.S. Virgin Islands is a territory, and Puerto Rico is a territory. So back then, the United States, the states, only included the 48 states. So here's a nice picture. It actually it may be hard to read, but it actually says Army Air Service. So that is one big airplane, a lot of wing, a lot of gasoline. And, and fortunately, some, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't read up on the engine, but they flew nonstop. Woohoo! Look how big that wing is compared to the people. Maybe they put some gas in the fuselage, too. I don't know. The first aerial refueling occurred by the, by the United States Army. It also occurred in 1923. It's a little more sophisticated now, but I got a picture here of the first air-to-air air -air refueling. And there it is. Yahoo. Hey, Fred! Grab a hold of this. Stick it, stick it in your fuel tank. I'm going to turn the crank, and I'm going to pump the fuel down. I bet they had a hand crank pump. I bet it wasn't an electric pump. Because back then, they didn't usually have electrical systems for the airplanes. I find this one to be rather interesting. It was actually the United States Army that had the first airplanes that flew around the world. They did not fly around the world nonstop. First flight around the world nonstop came about 30 or 40 years later. Yes, question. You may get a drink of water. I'm going to give out all the answers to the test while you're gone. So the U.S. Army, they set out with four airplanes. Two of them made it. It took them 175 days. They had four of these airplanes. They designed them here. I'll show you. That you could take off the wheels and put on floats. 
They took off, I can't remember where it was from, in the United States. And 175 days later, two of the four airplanes, and they were custom built for the U.S. Army. They were custom built by well, the company that turned into McDonnell Douglas. And McDonnell Douglas ended up making DC-3s, DC-4s, 5s, 6s, 7s, 8s, 9s, 10s, the MD-10, the MD-11. And McDonnell Douglas ended up getting bought out by Boeing about 10 or 20 years ago. In any case, it was custom built, four of them. But uh, it was uh, four pilots and four mechanics. And they had stationed around the planet gasoline and parts and engines and stuff. So they had all the logistics all lined up. It still took them 175 days to fly around the planet. But they did it. All right, let's talk about speed. Anybody in here like speed, as in high velocity in motor vehicles? Okay. I like, I like high velocity in motor vehicles. So just for fun, I'm not going to ask you these numbers. Whoops. There's some nice pictures, but I wanted to look at, there we go. So I put 1913 up there because the world record for the fastest airplane on the planet before World War I started was 126 miles an hour. That was the fastest airplane on the planet before World War I started. Now you'll notice World War I was 1914 to 1918. The speed didn't quite double. But look what happened to the airspeed by the time it was 10, 10 or 15, 10, or I guess eight years after, nine years after the war was over. It got faster and faster, and it got faster and faster. Even now, how'd you like to go 297 miles an hour in an airplane? That's not too bad. Yeah. Especially if it's low to the ground. If you ever get a chance, go to the Reno Air Races in Reno, Nevada. I went in 1979 and 1980. Man, that's cool. They fly like four or five hundred miles an hour at a hundred feet off the ground. There. Well, they die often. I mean, not every year. Somebody doesn't die every year. But sometimes more than one person does. So like I said, I'm not going to ask you any of these numbers. But I think it's interesting how fast that the world record speed record went after the war was over. So there's a lot of different air races out there. This one, I believe, is the Schneider Cup. And the Schneider Cup, you had to build it on a float plane. So they had really, really, really big engines, and the airplane was big enough to get the airplane and the floats off of the water. And then you'd fly around a, a track, an oval, I think it was. And whoever won... You won a prize, and you got famous. So air races actually drove. Whoops. So during this t this ten years here, the air air races actually were the driving factor. The fastest airplanes in the world were not flown by the U.S. military or by the French military or the Great Britain military or the Russian military or the Italian military or the Spanish military. The fastest airplanes in the world were civilian airplanes built for racing. In fact, I would bet money that in 1927, the fastest military airplane did not even go 200 miles an hour. I would bet money. It wasn't like the military airplanes were almost as fast. They weren't even close. Because you got also got to understand, after World War One, everybody went, "Yay! We'll never have one of them big wars again!" Yay! All right, I want to talk for a couple of minutes about a gyroplane. A gyroplane is not a helicopter. A gyroplane has rotor blades similar to a helicopter. But you need to understand. I'm not going to ask you on the test, but in a helicopter, the engine makes the rotor above spin. It's driven by the engine. What that means is a helicopter can stop in midair and hover and stay in one place. And then go forward, backward, left, and right. And it can stay there until it runs out of gas. It's because the engine is driving those blades. A gyroplane looks a lot like a helicopter. 
except for one, it's got usually a big set of blades on top. But there is no engine that spins it. The only reason those blades spin is because you're pulling the airplane, the gyroplane, through the air with a propeller. So it's really easy to tell the difference between a helicopter and a gyroplane because a gyroplane, although it's got blades like a helicopter, you can see this looks like an early airplane, and there's a propeller out front. Now, if you look at modern gyrocopters, they put the propeller in the back. They put the people in the front and the propeller in the back. But it's not the tail rotor like a helicopter. It's a propeller that actually pushes this all the way through. And you'll know, I know it's hard to tell, but those blades, they only get spun up. You can reach up there and get them to spin a little bit. But you've got to drive it down the runway, and the airflow makes it spin. And now the spinning blades get lift. Well, the nice thing about gyroplanes, what's the point of having a gyroplane if it can't hover? You can fly a lot slower than an airplane. And you'll notice built aeroplane them for money. Two stroke uh, chainsaw mag uh, chainsaw engines and air command. The problem is they're not as useful as the helicopter and but and they cost more than airplanes. So they never caught on like airplanes or helicopters. Now you could, there's a lot of people that fly them around as kits because you don't have to build much of a fuselage. What I find interesting is that Juan de la Sierva, who was born and raised in Spain, anybody ever heard of Spain? It's this country, it's stuck between Portugal and France. Anybody ever been to Portugal? Anybody ever been to France? Anybody ever been to Spain? It's just north of Morocco. Oh yeah, who's been to Morocco? Oh, most of the class, okay, great. In any case, he had the first successful gyroplane in 1928, and there's a picture of it. The, re the reason I talk about just gyros, gyroplanes a little bit, is because this is the precursor to helicopters. If somebody hadn't built a successful gyroplane, probably nobody would ever build a helicopter. And I'm not going to go into the details, but it's the rotor blade spinning around and not breaking is the hard part. And that's the part you like the least. Has anybody ever been in a helicopter where the blades broke off and you fell down and hit the ground and died? Yeah, I've not been in that kind of a fatal accident either. All right. Airlines and air mail. The first airline in the world was in France in 1918, immediately after the end of the war. Holy mackerel. They didn't stop shooting until, this, was it November? That doesn't leave a lot of time to start up an airline. <laughs> Somebody somewhere had probably a, a World War II surplus airplane. A lot of the first airlines made more money flying airmail than they did flying passengers. Germany, U.S. airmail. The first airmail in the United States did not go very well because they kept trying to fly the planes in bad weather, and they crash. And then they gave it to the U.S. Army, and then they did the same thing. It didn't work. And then finally they said, well, let's hire some professionals to do it. So then they hired professionals, and less people died and crashed. Crashed and died. And that was the Airmail Act. The Airmail Act of 1925 is when the federal government said, you know what, we don't want to do the airmail anymore. The Air Mail Act of 1925 is when they started giving contracts to airlines. When I say airlines, we're not talking about that big 100-seat jet-powered airplanes. We're talking about airplanes that would hold three people and a couple of hundred pounds of air mail. That was an airline. Today, we'd laugh at it and go, hey, nah, that's not an airline. But airplanes are a little bigger now. Does anybody know off the top of your head what's the heaviest airplane ever built? The AN-225, they only built one. The Russians built it to haul their space shuttle around that they never flew. Fully loaded, it weighs 1.4 million pounds. An Airbus A380 is about 1.3 million, and a big, the biggest 747 is just a hair under a million pounds. Pardon me? How does it fly with a lot of money? 
I mean, with a lot of lift and a lot of thrust. So it had really big wings and a lot of really big engines. I'm sorry? What's the question? The reason the Russians built it is because they were going to haul their space shuttle around on it. They, they only built one. It had six engines. Like a 747 has four. This thing had six big, giant engines. It was very large. So I already told you that the Air Mail Act of 1925 is when the federal government got out of the air mail business and started contracting it to the airlines. And then the Air Commerce Act of 1926 put into place regulating aircraft and pilots. Oh, you want to build airplanes? Well, you got to follow some rules. Oh, you want to be a pilot? you got to follow some rules. So literally, up until 1926, you could buy, build an airplane and sell it. And there were no federal laws to tell you if you had to build it safely or not. And you could go buy an airplane and get in it and try to fly it because there were no federal laws saying this is what it takes to get a pilot certificate. So literally it took, from 1918 to 26, so it took eight years after World War I was over to really put federal regulations in place to govern airplanes and pilots in the United States. So look at all those videos we could watch. Let's see. You think the air races would be the better one? Okay. Yeah, let's watch air races. On the racing circuit, one event, more than any other, came to symbolize the quest for speed. It started at Monaco in 1913. Jacques Schneider, the French Undersecretary for Air, Schneider wanted races. to promote the design of seaplanes. He donated a magnificent trophy for which That's international teams trophy. would compete. After the war, the Schneider Cup became the most coveted prize in aviation. Italy won it in 1920, 21, and Britain in 1922. Then the Americans sent a team of naval flights who swept the ball, the winner reaching 181 miles an hour. The secret lay in their new Curtis B-12 engine, which could be cooled by water even at very high power. In 1925, an American army man, James Doolittle, won the trophy. Then the United States government withdrew financial support, leaving the Schneider Cup to the Europeans. The British came up with a new contender, the Supermarine S-5, a new monoplane racer designed by R.J. Mitchell. The wings were thinner and therefore had to be braced. And it was braced all over, almost like a birdcage. We apprentices, we reckon we knew more than our bosses, looked at that and said, what are on all those wires on it? We thought that was all wrong. And then I went to see it on the slipway. And I was highly impressed. It was this beautiful aeroplane, streamlined, um, slim. To me, the perfect aeroplane that existed. Once again, it was engine power which counted. The sound of the engine was marvelous, of course. Especially on the turns when it came down off the glide with a full power. It really was something that made me blood tingle. That was very, very thrilling and exciting. We would see this little dot buzzing along, and the noise of the engine, which was a great roar, came very much reflected off the water, of course, across the sound, and you could see the airplane was at least half a mile ahead of the sound. The 1927 race was held in Venice between the Italians and the British. Both teams had new aircraft. The Italian M-52s gradually dropped out with engine problems, leaving two S-5s to romp on. Flight Lieutenant Webster won at 281 miles an hour. Webster returned to his hometown of Walsall to a hero's welcome. Once again, the search for more speed lay in more power. Rolls-Royce took up the challenge. 
Their R series of engines had many of the features of America's D-12, but they now produce nearly 2,000 horsepower. These engines were really just made for the racing to start with. They found the engine worked fine for 20 minutes, a half an hour. But of course that wasn't good enough, we wanted a bit more than that. And eventually they managed to produce at least an hour and a half absolute reliability. The new S6 racers with the R engines were only just ready in 1929. If Britain could win two more races, it could keep the Schneider Cup forever. A national will develop to do so. People came from all over the place. There were huge crowds on, the, on the, all the beaches. And it was a very exciting business. The amount of technology that went into those aeroplanes was tremendous. I mean, they really were touching on the sort of limits of aviation possibility. Britain won the 1929 race. And in 1931, John Boothman ended the saga of the Schneider Cup by winning it outright. <laughs> then George Stainforth broke the world speed record at 407 miles an hour. 407. I think that's a good time to quit. I'll see you gentlemen tomorrow.